So now, we are going to lesson 7, which is the measures of variation, still under chapter 1, exploring data. The objectives to hit for today are identify the strengths and limitations of the measures of variation, appreciate providing a sound interpretation, and solve real-life problems involving measures of variation. So we have there the word stocks. So these are shares or ownership in a company. This means that when people buy stocks, they become part owners of the company, whether in terms of profit or the loss of the company. The history of performance of a particular stock may be a useful guide to what may be expected of its performance in the foreseeable future. This is, of course, a very big assumption, but we have to assume it anyway. For example, if the parents of Juana de la Cruz invests 50,000 pesos in stock at the beginning of the year, and the value of that stock goes up to 60,000 pesos, thus having an increase of value of 10,000 pesos, then the rate of return here is 10,000 divided by 50,000, which is 0 0.2. Let's say we have here the year and the stock A and B, their rate of returns for year 2005, 2006, up to 2014. So looking at this table, where do you think it is wise to invest your money in? Is it on stock A or on stock B? So to determine which stock is the best to invest in, let us compute some measures of locations and measures of central tendency. Okay, so now you have here your maximum rate of return for stock A and stock B, your minimum rate of return for stock A and stock B, and their corresponding mean, median, and modes, or their, their measures of central tendency. Looking at this, we can see that all have the same values. So how do we determine which is better to invest in? So why don't we try graphing it from your previous knowledge in data presentation? As we noticed before, there are no differences in the computed summary statistics. However, as we can see here in this graph, the trend and the actual values of the rate of returns are different. Such observation tells us that it is not enough to simply use measures of location or measures of central tendency to describe a data set. We need additional measures such as measures of variation or measures of dispersion to describe further the data sets. So this is our topic for today. Not explosions, but the measures of dispersion. So you have here your two measures of variation, absolute measure of dispersion and relative measure of dispersion. When we say absolute measure of dispersion, it provides a measure of variability of observations or values within a data set. When we say relative measure of dispersion, it is used to compare variability of data sets of different variables or variables measured in different units of measurement. So for absolute measures of dispersion, we have range, IQR or interquartile range, you have variance and standard deviation. For relative measure of dispersion, we have coefficient of variation. For absolute measures of dispersion, I said before that we have four, range, IQR, interquartile range, variance and standard deviation. So you have here the range. Your range is the maximum value in the data set minus the minimum value in the data set. The larger the range, the larger is the dispersion of your data. As with mean having the weakness of outliers, your range has the weakness of the extremes. So if you have an extreme value, it may assume that the data has a large range. Second one, we have the IQR or interquartile range. When we say interquartile, it's between quartiles. So IQR, it's the value of your quartile 3 minus the value of your quartile 1. So it's the same as before, the larger the IQR or the larger the interquartile range, the larger is the dispersion of your data. So the difference between your range and IQR, your IQR gives the spread of the middle 50% of the data set. The third one, we have the variance. It's denoted by the symbol sigma squared. So your variance is computed as this. It's the summation of the square of the difference of every data and the mean all over the total number of observations, which is n. Another way to compute for the variance is the summation of the product of the square of each data and its frequency, all over n minus the square of the mean. In example, this is how we compute variance. You have there the score in a long test denoted as x. You have there the number of students, number as frequency. You have there xf, the product 
of the number of students and their frequencies. So you have 10 times 4 equals 40. You have 16 times 5 equals 80. 18 times 5 equals 90. And so on up to the last one, you have 50 times 9, which is 450. Then you have the difference, the x minus mean. So you need to first compute for the mean. We know that mean is computed as the summation of fx. So that's 4,807 divided by the total number of observations, which in this case is 150. So your mean is 4,807 divided by 150, or approximately, let's say, 32. So for the next column, we are going to compute for the difference of each data set and the mean. So get your data, 10 minus your mean, which is 32. So 10 minus 32, that's equivalent to negative 22. Next, you have 16 minus 32, that's equivalent to negative 16. Next, you have 18 minus 32, which is equivalent to negative 14. And so on up to the last row, we have 50 minus 32, that's equivalent to 18. Next is the square of the differences. From the formula, summation of the square of the differences. We have computed for the differences. We are now going to compute for the squares of the differences. So squaring the differences... We have negative 22 squared, that's equivalent to positive 484. 16, negative 16 squared is 256. Negative 14 squared is 196. Up to the last row, we have 18 squared, which is 324. Now, totaling all the differences, we have 1,822. Next, the next step is to multiply the differences and the frequency. So you have d squared times f. So 484 times 4, that's equivalent to 1,836. 256 times 5, that's 1,280. So the thing to remember here is when you have your data x and then you have your frequency, remember the columns that you're going to add to your table to be able to manually compute for the variance. So remember that you have to include xf, x minus upsilon or x minus mean, you need to add d squared and d squared times f. The red values there are actually those values that you're going to need to compute for the variance. So get the summation of the products of d squared and f, which is 14,009, divided by the total number of observations, which is 150. So your variance is computed as 14,009 divided by 150, which is 93.39. Another way to compute for the variance using the second formula is to do these columns, xf, x squared, and x squared, f. Take it literally, you need to multiply xf, that's fx also. You have x squared, squared that each data, 10 squared, 100, 16 squared, 256, up to the last 150 squared, 2,500, and then get the product of x squared and f. So x squared, 100 times f. 4, that's 100 times 4, which is 400. Next, you have 256 times 5, which is 1,280. Up to the last one, you're going to have 2,500 times 9, which is 22,500. So you're going to use the summation of the product of x squared and f, which is 168,057, divided by the total number of observations, which is 150. So to compute for your variance, you have 168,057 divided by 150, which is also, well, 93.39. Since you square the difference of each observation from the mean, the unit of measurement of the variance is the square of the unit used in measuring the observation. Such property is, well, a little bit problematic in interpretation. For example, Point squared or kilogram squared is difficult to interpret compared to inches squared. So because of that, we get the standard deviation. Standard deviation is symbolized as sigma, single sigma. It's because your standard deviation is the square root of your variance. So if we have the variance of 93.39, our standard deviation is the square root of 93.39, which is 9.6638 or approximately 9.6639. To interpret, we say that on the average, the scores of the students deviate from the mean score of 32 points 
by as much as or approximately 10 points. So, ibig sabihin, bawat score pala dun sa table kanina, nagde-deviate approximately from the mean. Diba ang mean natin, 32. So, bawat score nagde-deviate siya from the mean na 32 ng 10 points. So, yung susunod pala, 32, 22, 12, so 32, 22, 12, and then you have 32, 42, 52, and so on. So a simple technique to compute for your standard deviation and variance is to use your scientific calculator. Now again, these shortcuts or these steps are only applicable for a specific model of a cash calculator. To see what is the steps or process that you should take for your specific calculator, you can see the pattern here and apply it to your calculator. Going to our relative measures of dispersion, you have their coefficient of variation. So we can compute for the CV as your standard deviation divided by your mean multiplied to 100%. Stock A has a CV of 30.16%, while stock B has a CV of 42.32%. From this, we can interpret. Thus, we say that the stocks of stock A has more variation than the stocks in stock B. Here, we use the CV to compare the variability of two different data sets. So, stock A mo, it's a different data set from stock B. Recalling for the summary, we have there the absolute measures of dispersion and relative measures of dispersion. Absolute measures of dispersion, compare the variability within the data set. You have range, interquartile range, IQR, variance, and standard F. For relative measures of dispersion, you have there one only, coefficient of variation. It is used to compare the variability between data sets or different variables or variables measured in different units of measurements. So that is it for lesson number seven. Do not forget to try computing for variance and standard deviation using your scientific calculators. So don't, and also, well, don't forget to post your output. Ito, alam nyo ba, nung wala pang quarantine, Ang cycle ang bumubuhay sa mga sujante sa statistics. Dahil sa stat mode, sa variance, standard F, group data, and group data. So, aralin nyo to. Hmm.